Hello! It's now the continuation of the intestinal protozoans. And with that, let's start with non-pathogenic amoeba of man. And of course, one of the most commonly confused or mistaken for entamoeba histolytica whenever a medical technologist would do fecalysis is this one, entamoeba coli. So, entamoeba coli is a non-pathogenic amoeba, but it's rather significant also because whenever you find entamoeba coli in the stool sample, it, it, it has the potential coexistence with that of entamoeba histolytica, which means that there is a greater chance that you'll be able to find entamoeba histolytica in the stool sample as well. However, unlike entamoeba histolytica, entamoeba coli is said to be commensal. It is also cosmopolitan in distribution and considerably uh, more common than any other human amoebae that we will be discussing later on. So, basically, um, basic things to uh, differentiate it from that of Entamoeba histolytica would be the, if you will be looking at the cyst, the chromatoidal bar is splintered, and then if you will be looking at the trophozoite, um, you'll be able to see ingested bacteria rather than ingested RBC. Because in Entamoeba histolytica, you'll be able to find ingested RBC because Entamoeba histolytica, as what I told you, is hematophagus. But for Entamoeba coli, you'll be able to find ingested bacteria. So if you will be looking at the trophozoid of Entamoeba histolytica, particularly in its cytoplasm, you would notice that they are actually dirty, dirty looking. Let's discuss the cyst of Entamoeba coli. If you will be looking at the cyst and, and compare it with that of Entamoeba histolytica, um, they are actually larger between 10 to 35 microns in diameter. And if you'll also be looking at the nuclei, um, remember the mature cyst of Entamoeba histolytica is said to be quadrinucleated, meaning there are four nuclei. But for Entamoeba coli, you'll be able to see a maximum of eight nuclei. So the cytoplasm is much coarser, meaning they are more granular, and the chromatoidal bar is like splintered broomstick. Okay, so um, one of the most important things for Entamoeba coli is iodine, and it will reveal that the nuclei okay, have perinuclear masses. So, this is an example of the iodine stain, and you'll be able to see the nuclei here has. The nucleus here has perinuclear masses, and these are actually glycogen. And glycogen are the stored carbohydrates of Entamoeba coli. So, the cyst form would also have nuclei that are eccentrically located chromosomes. That has an eccentrically located chromosomes. Now, moving on, we also have here the trophocytes. So, Entamoeba coli trophocytes can actually measure between 15 and maximum diameter of 50 microns. In comparison with that of Entamoeba histolytica, it is more vacuolated or granular because of, instead of having ingested RBC, Entamoeba coli would have ingested bacteria. So it has a much narrower and less differentiated ectoplasm, but, but the pseudopodia, they are said to be broader, but it is not pointed. Remember in Entamoeba histolytica, we told you that uh, we discussed that uh, the pseudopodia are pointed, finger-like, but here it is blunted. So pseudopodia is more for feeding rather than locomotion. That is the reason why, if we will be observing Entamoeba coli under the microscope using a freshly stooled direct fecal smear, you would notice that Entamoeba coli's motility is is sluggish sluggish, non-progressive, meaning to say undirected, parang lasing, okay? Um, they have much thicker, irregular peripheral chromatin with large eccentric carosome in the nucleus. So, this would be the life cycle of Entamoeba coli. So, life cycle could happen between man and its external environment. So, just like any other um, amoeba, the the Infective stage of Entamoeba coli is the mature cyst. Okay, so man, humans will usually ingest um, the mature cyst, and at the lower ileum, it will exist 
and becomes trophocyte. Once they are trophocyte already, so this is already the stage wherein they are able to multiply by means of binary fission, and then trophocyte uh, will stay at the lumen of the colon or in the lumen of the colon. And once they have reached the large intestine, and that is the colon, wherein the water environment um, becomes much less, that's the time that they will insist. So, there are some cases that um, if they are not able to insist, trophocytes will disintegrate. But those trophocytes that were able to insist um, uh, would stay the colon, and that is the one that will be passed out okay, in the stool sample. So, Entamoeba coli, unlike Entamoeba histolytica, will not invade the villi of the small intestine and it will not also invade the villi of the colon. Okay, so another important um, amoeba of human is Entamoeba gingivalis. Okay, so yes, you're correct. So when we say gingivalis or from the word gingiva, because this particular type of amoeba is found in the oral cavity. So, what's so special about Entamoeba gingivalis? This particular type of amoeba doesn't have a cyst stage. So, it would only have the trophozoic stage. So, this particular amoeba lives on the surface of gum and teeth, in gum pockets, and sometimes even in the tonsillar crypts. So, probably transmission is direct, meaning through kissing, or in some cases, droplet spray, or sharing of utensils okay such as um spoon fork or even in some cases toothbrushes okay so entamoeba gingivalis trophozoites would measure between 10 to 20 microns and it moves quickly and has numerous blood pseudopodia so the food vacuoles may contain cellular debris so, Entamoeba gingivalis is not pathogenic. In fact, it is considered to be as commensal. However, the presence of Entamoeba gingivalis in the oral, cavi or oral cavity is indicative of poor oral hygiene. So, this is the, um, the artist perceptions of the Entamoeba gingivalis. So, you notice here, the pseudopodia is said to be blunt. Okay, so the food vacuoles are actually... Uh, would actually contain food debris and then you also have here the endosomes at the center of the nucleus So these are the different uh, morphologic appearance of Entamoeba gingivalis. So as you can see um, it is much better if you will be staining um, Entamoeba gingivalis with either iodine or methylene blue so that we will be able to observe the content of the nucleus and at the same time the endoplasm Okay, so moving on, we have we also have Endolimax nina. So this is the cyst of the Endolimax nina, and you notice that there are two nuclei that are adjacent to one another. Hence, Endolimax nina were able to get the nickname um, cross-eyed cyst. Okay, so it's very popular among medtech. So when you say cross-eyed cyst, the first thing that should come to your mind would be Endolimax nina. So this is another trophocyte form of Endolimax nina and one of the most distinguishing feature of Endolimax nina's trophocyte is the presence of the black-like carison. So there is a black-like carison. Okay, so this is the Endolimax nina cyst and trophocyte. And then another important amoeba is Iodamoeba butskli. Okay? Iodamoeba butskli has both the cyst and trophocyte form. If you will be looking at the ectoplasm, there is a very large glycogen mass that is readily, readily stained with iodine. Hence, the nickname iodine cyst. So, Entamoeba gingivalis, Endolimax nina, Iodamoeba butskli, all of them are considered to be as non-pathogenic amoebae of humans. Okay, so here's another example of Iodamoeba butskli. Um, I just want to be clarified when it comes to the illustration. So this is the actual trophozoite. So please watch my cursor. So this is the actual trophozoite. However, in artist perceptions or in the illustration of the artist, you would notice that 
there are some extra illustrations here. So this represents pseudopodia. And pseudopodia would only be visible, microscopically speaking, if the organisms are actually motile. And, it's, and it is best observed in direct fecal smear or in wet mouth preparation. So if you will be examining stain, meaning to say, um, preserved slides that we usually uh, with, that we usually look under the microscope as student in the school, you would not be able to properly visualize pseudopodia. So that's very important that uh, it's very important that using wet mount preparation um, is actually being done so that you'll be able to observe the locomotory organelles or in this case you'll be able to observe the type of motility that a certain protozoan would possess. And then. Um, by Entamoeba fragilis um, is another type of amoeba that doesn't have any cyst stage and it does not form cysts. And another thing is that the trophocytes cannot survive through small intestine. So how would you think this particular organism will, will infect humans? Probably um, humans get infected by this endocommensal. What do I mean by endocommensal? Meaning to say... Um, this particular amoeba is found inside the ova of pinworm. So when we say pinworm, that's Enterovis vermicularis. So whenever a person ingests pinworm ova, okay, so that's the mode of transmission, so that person may probably ingest the entamoeba fragilis as well. Okay, because as, as, as an independent organism, since it, since it doesn't have troph cyst stage, um, trophocyte is such a fragile structure that it cannot withstand the acidity of the gastric tubes. So there's no way by which the entamoeba fragilis would be able to would be able to infect our small intestine without passing through the stomach. So in order for them to get through our small intestine is by is by being an endocommensal with that of Enterobis vermicularis egg. So incidentally, um, there's now a new classification of the Entamoeba fragilis and they're considering this particular organism to be mastigophore or to be flagellated organisms instead of amoeba. But the name remains the Entamoeba fragilis. Okay, so these are the different stain trophocyte and cyst of human amoebae. So, Entamoeba histolytica is the only pathogenic. Entamoeba hartmani is a small race, Entamoeba histolytica. Entamoeba polecki is found in animals. And if you will be looking at the life cycle, so generally speaking, they have the same life cycle. So, always remember that cyst is always the infective stage of amoeba, be it coli, hartmani, polecki, nina, or even butchki. Okay, so you might want to answer some of the guide question. So, which of these trophocytes when acting as pathogen is likely to ingest RBC in the host? So, again, remember our clue that among the amoebae that we have discussed, only Entamoeba histolytica is hematophagus. Hence, the answer is letter B, Entamoeba histolytica. So, the point of differentiation in which one has to depend for separation of E histolytica with that of E hartmani is what? Again, Entamoeba hartmani is a small race, Entamoeba histolytica. Hence, it is the size. So the answer is letter C. Okay, so at this point, we shall be discussing the free-living amoeba. So when we say free-living, it means that this particular species of amoeba are found in the environment. However, even if they are free-living, this particular species of protozoans are still capable of being pathogenic. So what are the examples of the free-living amoeba? So one of them is Acanthamoeba. Acanthamoeba species trophocyte is between 10 to 45 microns in diameter and it has, it has only one nucleus, hence the term nun, uninucleated, 
but it has central nucleus and it is also consists of finely granulated cytoplasm. Now, why do you think we call them acanthamoeba? So, acanthos, okay, in Latin refers to thorns, okay? So, because if you will be looking at the morphology of acanthamoeba, you would notice that they are made up of spikes, okay? So, these are spiny filaments, so we call them acanthopodia, okay? Spiny filaments, and these spiny filaments are important for locomotion, and the locomotion or motility is described to be sluggish polydirectional movement. Polydirectional means that it, it is not progressive. It can actually go at different directions. So the cyst is said to be double-walled and it is, said to, it is said to be wrinkled. So double-walled double with outer wrinkled wall. Okay. So, acanthamoeba even if they are said to be free living, may infect humans, okay? And some of them could even be our, our eyes. So, acanthamoeba, um, there are cases that um, they attribute, um, if you're using contact lens and then, and then you're, you're, you're using contact lens and then you're soaking your contact lens in contaminated water with, and that water, is infested with acanthamoeba so there's a chance that you will get the infection okay so acanthamoeba may enter your body through eyes so that's one possibility so they are incriminated in a number of cases of inflammation and even with the opacity of the cornea so meaning lumalabu yung mata because of the infection with acanthamoeba most of these ocular infections were in contact lens wearer who are actually using homemade saline solution and the water that is used for the preparation of homemade saline solution is contaminated with acanthamoeba. So, usually, um, if for acanthamoeba, um, there would be unilateral diffuse punct punctate epitheliopathy, dendritic epithelial lesion, and this may gradually progress to stromal infection associated with ring infiltrate formation aside from that there is also an enlarged cornea okay which is the patognomonic of the infection meaning um the enlarged cornea is described to be as the keratoneuritis, keratoneuritis and this is one of the most uh well this is considered as the cardinal sign of having uh, acanthamoeba infection is scleritis which is the inflammation of the sclera may be found in advanced cases so how does it feel to have acanthamoeba infection it is as if you have a foreign body parang napuwing ka okay severe ocular pain photophobia and blurred vision most of the time the pain is more severe than signs in early course of the disease okay so if you will be looking at the life cycle so cysts and trophocytes okay cysts and trophocytes okay are actually uh, can actually um, undergo life cycle in the environment okay so trophocytes then become cysts okay so amoebae which uh, which could be in the form of cysts and trophocytes can enter humans in various ways how one by means of eye like when you are using contact lenses another thing is through nasal passageway nasal passages to the lower respiratory tract how does it happen for example um, you swam in water that is infested with acanthamoeba doing baha for example or in warm hot spring okay so acanthamoeba may enter nasal passages or another thing is if you have ulcerated or broken skin so acanthamoeba may also enter so if the acanthamoeba enters through your eye it will result into severe keratitis if it enters through your nasal passages it will result in the so-called GAE 
or the granulomatous amoebic encephalitis or disseminated disease in individuals with compromised immune system. Okay, if it enters via skin, ulcerated or broken skin, it will also result into um, GAE, disseminated disease, or skin lesions, particularly in individuals with compromised immune system. Okay, so this is the life cycle. And as you notice, humans are the end host. Why? Because unlike any other parasites that has to pass through another human in order for the life cycle to continue, Acanthamoeba is naturally found in some environment. Okay. Another example of, uh, by the way, um, one of the most important species of Acanthamoeba is Acanthamoeba albertsoni. Okay, so Acanthamoeba albertsoni. Okay, so we also have here Nigleria. Nigleria is described to be as amoeboflagellate. So these are two important, two different protozoans, amoeba and flagellates. But for Nigleria, it is described to be as amoeboflagellate. So what does it mean? So um, amoeboflagellate means that the trophozoite can transform into non-reproductive flagellate stage or a resistant cyst. Okay? The trophozoite can transform into a non-reproductive flagellate stage or a resistant cyst. So, Nigeria gruberi is said to be non-pathogenic, but the one that can cause the PAM or primary meningoencephalitis in humans so is Nigeria fowleri. Okay? So, Nigleria fowleri. The trophozoic is, set, uh, is characterized by blunt pseudopodia, and the nucleus, as obviously as you can see here, has a very large carison. And the cytoplasm may also be filled with RBC. So, um, Nigleria fowleri may enter through the olfactory bulb and uh, 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 sorry by nasal passageway okay so whenever we swam for example um, um there was a there was a time that flooding occurs in metro manila because of uh, typhoon and and heavy monsoon rain so flooding occurs and there are some street children who swam okay in in flood and some of these children who swam in flood Okay, has been reported to have the PAM. So what usually happens here is that when the organism, when the organisms um, enter the nasal passageway, some of them uh, will get in touch okay, with the olfactory nerves and then through the olfactory valve, it will enter the CNS. Okay. So after entering the nose and nasal cavities, the trophozoites will migrate along the olfactory nerves. So they would have to pass through the crib reform plate and eventually into the cranium. So the amoeboid trophozoites will multiply rapidly by means of binary fission in the brain. And this alone will cause rapid brain tissue destruction. So the patients would feel severe headache, um, fever, neck rigidity, mental confusion, followed by coma and death. So, that is actually the result of brain destruction. So, if you will be looking at the life cycle here. So, the cyst in the environment. Okay. And then you have here the trophozoite. Okay. So, this is the infective stage. And then becomes flagellated form. So, hence the term amoeboflagellate. Okay. And then... It will undergo promytosis, which means that in the environment, the cycle can continue until such time that human hosts would have water-related activities such as swimming, underwater diving, or other water sports that can result in water going up to the nose. So, amoebae will penetrate the nasal mucosa. It will migrate to the brain by the olfactory nerves, causing the PAM or primary amoebic meningoencephalitis in healthy individuals. So, 
Trophozoites in CSF and brain tissues are considered to be as the diagnostic stage. So, meaning to say, for the diagnosis of Naglira Fowleri, so it's very important that we submit um, CSF sample in the laboratory. So that we'll be able to see the cyst stage, the trophozoite stage, or even the flagellated stage. Okay? The trophozoites are clustered in small vessel near the brain surface. So if you will be enlarging this, you'll be able to see the different trophozoites of the Nigeria Fowleri. So there was this case study uh, when Nigeria was seen in Oklahoma. So two boys ages between 7 and 9, and nine in Tulsa, Oklahoma died from a very rare parasite Saturday, August 5, 2005 due to infection with Nigeria Fowleri. So two boys were not related but both came to their doctor with symptoms of fever. They have been hallucinating hallucinating, and, and they have headaches. So Despite of the medical care that was given to them, neither was neither of them was able to survive the deadly infection. Okay, so of the 200 known cases of Nigeria infection in the past in the past years, only two people have survived. So this is a highly deadly, um, highly fatal infection. Only 24 infections were documented in the United States before. Okay, so here of course. Um, the answer here is a 12 year old female is brought to the emergency room with meningitis and a history of swimming in warm water spring motile amoeba is seen in CSF so of course the answer is Nigeria Fowleri we're so fortunate that we do not have we do not have cases of Nigeria Fowleri in our hot spring particularly in Los Baños because this would really be a problem especially during summer okay so the same answer here is Nigeria Fowleri. So moving on, let us discuss the other protozoans. Okay, so other protozoans that may cause um, intestinal infection. So we have under the ciliates, we have the Balantidium coli. Then under the coccidian parasites, we have the Isospora belly, Sarcocystis species. But the most popular is Cercocystis communis, and then the Cryptosporidium. And then the, uh, uh, under the Blastocystis, we have Blastocystis hominis. Okay, so let's discuss um, Balantidium coli. So Balantidium coli is a common parasite of pigs, and they are said to be tissue invader, which means that they have the ability to invade large intestine. So, they, they are the causative agent of the so-called um, balantigial dysentery, okay? So, um, the infected stage is the cyst stage. And incidentally, balantigium coli is said to be as the largest intestinal protozoa. So, to diagnose it, uh, we can do the direct fecal smear, concentration technique, and even rectal biopsy. Largest intestinal protozoan. Look at the cyst. It can measure up to 64 microns in diameter. Look at the trophozoite. It can measure up to 70 microns in diameter. So, the cyst is spherical with thick wall. The cytoplasm has kidney bean shape or macronucleus, vacuoles, and cilia. Okay, so... The trophozoite has hair-like cilia, and the trophos and the cilia is responsible for its tumbling motility. The opening is called cytophage, so this is where the food will enter the trophozoites. And if you will be looking at the trophozoites of Balantidium coli, you would notice that there are two types of nuclei. These are the macronucleus, and a much smaller is a spherical micronucleus. So, Balantidium coli strophocyte would also have two contractile vacuoles. Okay? So, this is the cyst. Okay? And a much larger trophocytes. So, the cytophage is here. 
and then the hair like you're supposed to see hair like cilia here surrounding the entire cell and then this is the macro nucleus okay so here is the macro nucleus and here's the micro nucleus the contractile vacuole is found also in the cytoplasm okay so very beautiful stain of balantidium coli Okay, but it's quite uh, in this case you'll see the macronucleus here here's the micronucleus the cytophage and then the two contractile vacuoles and the cilia the cilia surround the entire bacterial cell and here's the cyst of balantidium coli so you notice that there are no cysts uh, sorry there are no cytophage in the cyst because the cyst is no longer the feeding stage. So cytophage is where the food or the nutrients will enter balantidium coli. But during the cyst stage, it is no longer considered as the feeding stage. So there's no need for the cytophage. Okay, so balantidium coli. So the cytophage is also known as the oral ciliature. And then here's the somatic ciliature. So... The other part of the cilia that, that, that is not found in the cytophage is called somatic ciliature. So here's another example of balantidium coli. Hey, so let us discuss now the coccidian parasites or the apicocomplexa. So the coccidian parasites or the coccidians are members of the phylum apicocomplexa and they infect intestinal mucosa but not the RBCs of the vertebrate host so this includes the cryptosporidium species um, cyclospora cayetanensis um, isospora belly and sarcocystis lindermani so blastocystis is now uh, is now a different um, group okay the blastocystis hominis okay so uh, we have here the suborder Imerina. So, under the suborder Imerina, so this is the table that summarizes the suborder. We have the Isospora belly, um, Cercocystis lindermani, Cryptosporidium parvum, the Cyclospora species, and Toxoplasma gondi. So, I think we will be discussing Toxoplasma gondi um, later on. Uh, this is not part of the intestinal protozoans. So isosporal belly, um, the mode of transmission is is the in, is the ingestion of the infective stage. In this case, it is the oocyst. Okay, for Lindermani, the infective stage is called the bradyzoids, and we usually get it from infected muscle. For Cryptosporidium parvum, okay, um, oocyst is the infective stage. For cyclospora, ripe cyst or the mature cyst. And for Toxoplasma gondi, it is oocyst, ingestion of oocyst. Or um, this one can also be um, trans transmitted from mother to fetus. So that's why it's called transplacental. And the table here represents the diagnostic test. Okay, so let's discuss first the life cycle of cryptosporidium um, this is now the life cycle happening in humans okay so the cyst the cyst is actually being passed out from the feces which contaminates water so humans could either swim in recreational water or drink contaminated water okay with oocyst and then oocyst Okay, becomes uh, you, you ingest oocyst and that is the infective stage so once you have ingested the oocyst it becomes sporozoid and then it will now penetrate the villi of the intestine and form trophozoid okay so two and then um, there are two types of cycle inside the human body the asexual life cycle meaning the trophozoites becomes will form merons so if they form merons we call them the merozoites okay so if it's a type 1 meron 
it will just be the asexual cycle. However, some merozoites um, will be converted into type 2. So once they are converted into the type 2 merot, the merozoites will be the undifferentiated gamut. Okay? What do you mean by undifferentiated gamut? Um, uh, always remember that there are two types of gametes. The macro gametes and the micro gametes. So they say that the macro gametes is female and then the micro gametes is male. However, when you say undifferentiated gamont, it means that you do not know yet what will it become. Will it become micro? Will it become macro? Nevertheless, the macro gamont is here and then the micro gametes, they are much smaller. So, kumbaga sa humans, they are like sperm cell, but they are not sperm cell, okay? These are protozoans. Okay, the macro gametes, micro gametes will penetrate the macro gametes and will fertilize the macro gametes. Hence, the union between macro gametes and micro gametes will result into zygote. Okay? Then, the zygote could become sporulated oocyst, which could either infect the same host we call it auto infection or it could also exit the host and infect another humans or it may infect other reservoirs such as cattle okay so the cryptosporidium oocysts are said to be the infective and diagnostic stage at the same time so the size is between 3 to 6 microns and they are usually large between 4 to 5 microns. The sporulated oocysts may contain 4 sporocytes okay, and they are excreted by the infected host through feces and possibly other routes such as respiratory secretions. So once the sporocytes are released, it will parasitize epithelial cells of the intestine. Hence the parasites may undergo a sexual life cycle. So guys, a sexual life cycle is also known as schizogony or merogony. Okay, merons one. Remember the merons one? Now, some of them, some of the merozoites will be converted into merons two. This is where sexual life cycle will begin. So take note that the other term for sexual life cycle is gametogony. So again, schizogony for a sexual life cycle, gametogony for sexual life cycle. It will produce two types of of my of gametes: microgamonts male, the macrogamonts female. Fertilization will take place if the macrogamonts will penetrate the macrogamonts, resulting into the formation of zygotes. This will result into oocysts, which can sporulate in the intestine. So, spherical or the oval oocyst can exit through humans by shedding, particularly when you defecate, and this becomes the infective stage. So, Cryptosporidium parvum, as you can see, this is the oocyst found at the surface of the small intestinal cells. You know that oocysts can also be stained using an acid fasting. So, acid fasting is usually being used for staining uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis but this can also be used for staining the oocyst of cryptosporidium parvum so this is the unstained okay uh, wet mount but this one is stained with an acid fasting particularly the quinones method so the oocyst may contain four sporozoids so this is how the oocyst would look like under the electron microscope and you would notice that there are four sporozoids. So one, two, three, and four. And they are attached to the small intestinal cells. Okay, so moving on, we also have um, Isospora bellis in which the life cycle is similar to Cryptosporidium. Okay, so the trophozoites, the merozoites, and gametocytes occur in the cytoplasm of the small intestine. Not on the surface because, diba, if you notice, in Cryptosporidium, it occurs at the surface. But here, it occurs inside of the intestinal cell. Small intestinal cell. Small intestine cell. Okay. So, the oocysts are said to be 
20 to 30 microns long and they are released in the pieces. So, if you're able to see this one, this one is considered to be as the diagnostic stage. The OOCs are infected to, to new humans by a human fecal contamination. So, this is the example of the OOCs of Isospora belly. So, take note, unlike Cryptosporidium parvum, the OOCs of Isospora belly, okay, the infection is found inside the intestinal wall so that's the reason why in order for you to see them you have to submit histological section of the small intestine and here you'll be able to see the oocyst of isospora belly okay now this one is sarcocystis lindemani okay and here's cyclospora okay so let us now discuss the flagellates. Okay. Under the flagellates, uh, we have two types of flagellates. Okay. So first we have the atrial and luminal flagellates. And then we also have the blood and tissue flagellates. So in this case, um, under the atrial and luminal flagellates, we have um, Georgia lamblia. Um, the entamoeba fragilis, I told, this was discussed during our discussion of amoeba, but I've told you that they have reclassified the entamoeba fragilis under mastigophora. And then we also have um, chylomastix masnili, enteromonas hominis, retortamonas intestinalis, and trichomonas hominis. And then under the blood and tissue flagellates, we have two species of Leishmania and trypanosoma. So, as you can see, these are the trophozoites, okay? Um, trophozoites have flagella. Cis do not have flagella because cis are said to be non-motile, okay? But the trophozoites are supposed to be motile, hence they are provided with flagella. Okay, so what are the different, um, what are the different species of atrial and luminal flagellates. So we have Giardia lamblia or Giardia intestinalis, Chylomastic mastili, Trichomonas hominis, and Trichomonas tenax. Among the five species that I've listed here, Giardia lamblia are said to be pathogenic, Trichomonas vaginalis is said to be pathogenic, but Trichomonas vaginalis is the only one that is sexually transmitted, sexual contact. Okay, so the habitat of the first three are the large intestine. I'm sorry, but for the Giardia lamblia, it may also infect the small intestine. Okay? But for Trichomonas tenax, it inhabits the oral cavity. And for tri Trichomonas vaginalis, of course, it inhabits the genital urinary tract of both male and female. So, for Giardia lamblia, Chylomastic masnili, and, and Chylomastic masnili, um, they have cyst and trophocyte stage. So if there are cyst and trophocyte stage, cysts are considered to be as the infective stage. But all species of trichomonas doesn't have troph uh, doesn't have the cyst stage. So the mode of transmission, all of them would be by means of ingestion, except for trichomonas tenax. It is by means of oral contact, such as scraping. And for Trichomonas vaginalis, it is transmitted through sexual contact. As regards to the specimen for diagnosis, um, we, you can submit stool sample for the diagnosis of Georgia lamblia, Chylomastix masnili, Trichomonas hominis, and Trichomonas. Yeah, for the, for the three. For Trichomonas tenax, oral scraping. For trichomonas vaginalis, um, urine, vaginal, cervical, urethral discharge. Okay? So, again, trichomonas vaginalis is the most common parasites found in urine. But, the true urinary parasite is Cystosoma hematogenum. Okay? So, let's talk about Giardia lamblia. So, Giardiasis or lambliasis is the infection caused by Giardia lamblia. So, the incubation period is between 1 to 4 weeks and it can lead to steatorrhea. 
So when you say steatorrhea, it can cause um, lipids in the stool and may cause dysentery but no mucus and blood. 90% of infections are said to be asymptomatic and acute giardiasis uh, is characterized by the presence of diarrhea, gas, anorexia for about anorexia walang ganang kumain for about 1 to 2 weeks. So, chronic giardiasis is characterized by diarrhea and malabsorption. Malabsorption cannot properly absorb nutrients. Hence, steatorrhea is present, meaning there's lipids in the stool. So, lab diagnosis uh, would include direct fecal smear, concentration technique, string test, meaning um, you, uh, you allow the patient to ingest a pill that has a string, and eventually you recover the pill and isolate the organisms from the duodenum, okay? X-ray and ELISA test, serologic test. Okay, so this is how we characterize Jargelambria. Um, old man's eyeglass, so that's how they describe Jargelambria. The size is between 10 to 20 microns, and these are like the half peer organisms. It has eight flagella, so if you'll be counting, there are eight flagella here. And then there are two axostyles. So these are the axostyles. And this, there are two anteriorly located large suction discs here. Okay. And the cytoplasm may contain two uh, nuclei here. And two parabasal bodies. Uh, two parabasal bodies here. Okay. And the endosome is said to be centrally nucleated. So, the motility of Giardia lambria is described as the falling leaf motility. Okay. So, however, not all of these parts may be present, but this one is the common feature of Giardia lambria trophosomes. Okay. Giardia lambria cyst is characterized by the size between 8 to 19 microns and they are usually they would usually range between 11 to 12 microns so the shape the shape is oval or ellipsoidal so the nuclei usually uh it has four nuclei quadrinucleated then and located at one end the the endosomes are centrally located the deep staining fibers or fibrils may be seen lying laterally or obliquely across fibrils in the lower part of the cyst. So there are no, no flagella. At least the flagella are not yet outside the cell. Okay? So as you can see, the retracted flagella here inside. The axoneme is here. It's the axoneme. And you have a very thin cyst wall. Okay? So this is the appearance of, sorry, Jargelamblia cyst. Jargelamblia as seen in the small intestine. So you'd notice here, this is the Jargelamblia in the small intestine, more common in IgA deficient. It's supposed to be small letter G. IgA is the antibodies found in the mucosa and they are important for mucosal immunity. Okay, it occurs after, immunity may occur after infection. So, the pathology is the villus atrophy or the creep hyperplasia. So, if you will be looking at the mode of transmission of Jargelamblia, so you usually get it by eating contaminated water, food, or hand fomites. Fomites means um, in inanimated objects with infected cysts. So, the cyst will enter your oral cavity and it will undergo um, existation meaning magiging trophocytes siya. and then trophocytes will divide by binary fusion so you can pass out either the trophocytes or the cyst okay so from trophocyte it, it becomes cyst again by means of the process of encystation so what are the pathology of Jargelamblia infection so it is characterized by abdominal pain by nausea, flatulence, weight loss, and, it, and um, these signs occurs in most of the cases. Diarrhea is caused by production of watery mucus in response to trophocytes. So the stool becomes foul-smelling, bulky, and explosive. 
and most of the time watery. So there are numerous trophocytes and this can occur, okay, uh, numerous trophocytes will cover and shorten the microvilli, hence the villus atrophy okay, of intestinal cells causing malabsorption of nutrients. So these are the the, the flagella of Jarjalandia and then these are the so here's another example of the Georgia Lambda trophocytes and cyst. Okay, so moving on, we also have another type of mastigophora, and this is the chylomastix masnili. So as you can see, um, chylomastic masnili is commonly known as the lemon cyst because of the protrusion here at the anterior portion that appears like a lemon. So the mode of transmission is by drinking contaminated food or water, the same as Jarjalambia, okay? And then there is a non-pathogenic colonization. So non-pathogenic meaning it doesn't have, it doesn't cause virus atrophy unlike Jarjalambia. And cysts and trophocytes will pass in stools, but only cysts will survive in the environment. Okay, so chylomastic masnivis trophocytes is between 6 to 24 microns and 10 to 15 per shape there's only one nuclei and it is not visible in unstained mouth the flagella are made up of there are three flagella at the anterior portion okay but one occurs from the cytostomal group so the motility is stiff and rotary okay there is also a prominent cytosome so this is the prominent cytosomes extending up to one third or one half of the length of the body, the spiral groove occurs at the ventral surface. So, the chylomastic masnili is called. So, as what I've told you, chylomastic masnili is also known as the lemon shaped cyst because of the presence of anterior hyaline nub. Okay, it has one nucleus not visible in unstained preparation. And the cytostome is characterized by um, supporting fibrils. So this is the cytostome characterized by supporting fibrils and it is usually visible in stain preparation. So this is the common um, diagnostic stage in feces. So this is the lemon cyst. Or in some cases, um, some literature would even call it the nipple cyst. Okay. So let's talk about the genus Trichomonas. Okay, so the human trichomonads. So there are three species of trichomonas, but only two are normally harmless. So let's talk about the most pathogenic. So the most pathogenic species is Trichomonas vaginalis because it may cause urethritis and vaginitis. It is characterized by inflammation of the vaginal mucosa followed by Production of greenish, yellowish liquid secretion accompanied by intense itching. So, makati talaga kapag merong trichomonas. Okay? It can be acquired through, take note ha, sexual contact, infectious toilet seats, bed linens, and towels. So, it will uh, cases of vaginitis will increase in group wherein proper hygiene is deficient. So, infection, males can also be infected, but Males infection are latent and asymptomatic, so they are usually the carrier, so they will infect the female. So, lab diagnosis would include um, would include uh, um, samples of urine samples, urethral, vaginal, cervical secretion that can be stained with Jimsa, acridine orange, pap smear, Romanowski stain, and we have to look for trophocytes since there are no cis stains. We can also culture Trichomonas vaginalis by using diamonds region. So, what would be the clinical presentation? Most of the time, males are asymptomatic, but females are symptomatic. So, the symptoms of females would include vaginitis, and it is characterized by purulent discharge, it's prominent, and can be accompanied by vulvar, and cervical lesions, abdominal pain, dysuria, which means a uh, uh, difficulty in urination. So the incubation period is between 5 to 28 days. In men, 
As what I've told you, the infection is asymptomatic. However, males will usually sometimes um, can experience urethritis, epididymitis, and prostatitis. So if you will be looking at the life cycle here, there would be sexual intercourse between male and female. So they can they can actually um, pass trichomonas vaginalis. So the trophozoites in the vaginal and prostatic secretions um, will divide by means of longitudinal binary fissions. And then there you have it. The trophozoites are found in the vagina or the orifice of the urethra. Okay. So so what's our part what are the different parts of trichomonas vaginalis? Okay. So you have here um, the axostyle. Okay, you have here the this is the axostyle, and then this is the axostyle membrane, and there are four flagella. So you'd notice that the granules, there are granules here at the cytoplasm, we call it the siderophil granules. Okay. So the costa is the thickening of the membrane. So there is the costa. Okay, the thickening okay, of the membrane. Okay. So the undulating membrane. Okay, here's the undulating membrane. So for trichomonas vaginalis, if this is the entire body or the entire cell of trichomonas vaginalis, the undulating membrane occurs one half of the body. From this point up to this point. Okay? But it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to see it in unstained preparation. It's much better if you will be using a stained preparation for the description of Precomonas vaginalis. But do you know that if you're using uh, most of the time Precomonas vaginalis can be diagnosed by a simple routine urinalysis and and Medtex would usually be amazed of seeing Precomonas vaginalis. You can actually search it in YouTube. Um, they would you'd be able to see jerky tumbling motility. So that's how they describe the motility of Trichomonas vaginalis. So treatment would include metronidazole or flagyl. Tinidazole is an alternative drug. Um, control is the use of latex or polyurethane condoms during vaginal intercourse, which can prevent transmission of trichomoniasis. So trichomoniasis is the infection with Trichomonas vaginalis. Uh, of course, uh, monogamous sex partner is very good because you prevent, you limit the number of sex partner and do not go back and forth between partner. Uh, practice of sexual abstinence or have to limit sexual contact to one uninfected partner. So that's monogamous relationship. So infected individuals should avoid sexual contact and should see a doctor. Okay, so other species uh, would include Enteromonas hominis. Okay, are intertinalis and T hominis. So they, they are considered as non pathogenic. So our intestinalis is the Retortamonas intestinalis, T hominis is the Pentatrichomonas hominis. So they are non pathogenic. So the presence of cysts and or trophozoites in the stool are actually indicative of fecal contamination of food or water source. Thus, it does not rule out other parasitic infections. So the fact that you you have this in your stool means that um, your the one that you are ingesting, such as food and water, may not be clean at all. So other parasites could uh, could possibly be present because they have the same life cycle as Enterotomonas, Retortomonas, and Pentatrichomonas. Okay. However, um, not all would have. Um, trophozoites and cyst stage at the same time. Okay? So, let's say, for example, Pentatrichomonas hominis doesn't have a cyst Okay. Um, trichomonas tenax. Okay. So, the Trichomonas tenax is characterized by, um, again, undulating membrane which occupies one half of the body. Have four anterior flagella and the posterior flagellum is located here. This is the axostyle. So it is found in the oral cavity, in tartar, around the gums, as well as the nasopharyngeal region. So it is not considered as pathogenic, but 
the presence of Percomonas tenax, katulad ng diantami, katulad ng entamiba gingivalis, is indicative of poor oral hygienic condition. Okay, and then you also have here um, Trichomonas hominis or Pentatrichomonas hominis, characterized by again. Um, you have the undulating membrane that occupies almost the entire cell. So that's the difference of Trichomonas hominis with that of the two other Trichomonas species. But you also have four, four um, anteriorly located uh, flagella, and then you also have the axis tile here. Okay. So diagnosis of intestinal protozoans. How do we deal with it? Um, when we suspect acute or chronic GI symptoms, we can confirm the detection of parasite in feces or we can also do the coproantigen serologically or molecular probes. There are also special stain, particularly for cryptosporidium, we can use acid fast stain. For Jarja, you have, uh, there are, for three non-consecutive days, there, is, there are inconsistent excretion. So to confirm, we can do duodenal aspirates or biopsy, and we can also do presumptive treatment at chronic cases. For entamoeba, histolytic, entamoeba, it's very important to differentiate histolytica versus dyspar because, you know, they resemble one another. So the sigmoidoscopy will also reveal lesions, okay? Aspirates and biopsy may also be submitted, particularly if entamoeba histolyticas become extra intestinal. So, speaking of extra-intestinal, um, we can diagnose it by symptoms associated with certain organs. So, so, if it's the liver, usually there would be hepatomegaly. So, first, the doctor would have to determine if there has been history of dysentery. So, serology may also be useful, but with reservation. Um, if it's IgG, Current, uh, uh, sorry, IgM current infection. Past infection will usually be positive with IgG. So imaging may also be important that abscess aspiration can be done in selected cases. So usually you'll be able to aspirate radish brown liquid and you'll be able to see trophocytes at the abscess wall. Treatment. Um, for the treatment, for the treatment, um, metronidazole is the drug of choice for Georgia. 750 milligrams twice a, uh, twice a day for five days and it has a 90% cure rate. So it's treatable. So alternative treatment would be pinidazole, single dose, paromomycin uh, in cases of pregnancy, quinicrine, and furazolidone. For entamoeba, asymptomatic um, is treated also with iodocinol and paromomycin. For symptomatic treatment with metronidazole, pinidazole, followed by luminal agents. You should also be draining liver abscess because of the, only with, for those with high probability of rupture. For cryptosporidium, there's no highly effective drugs because this one is usually associated with immunocompromised patients. So, paromomycin has modest benefits. So, therefore, we have to instill um, supportive care such as rehydration, nutritional support, and anti-motility agents so that diarrhea will not occur. Okay, so in summary, please study this table. So this table will give you at least the bird's eye view of... So I will be removing my... my and, ah, sorry, value here. So please study this table because this table will give you the bird's eye view of the different um, intestinal protozoans. Okay, so there you have it. Um, please do not forget to study and stay safe. God bless everyone and see you in our next screencast.